Good evening. Welcome to the program. While not unprecedented in a rare move, the parents of a school shooter now face charges for their children's alleged actions. James and Jennifer Crumbly are charged with four counts of involuntary manslaughter for their role in Tuesday's shooting, where their son Ethan allegedly killed four and injured seven others at a school near Detroit, Michigan. As we come on the air tonight, the parents are missing. They were supposed to turn themselves in earlier today. They failed to do so. Their lawyer says they left town after the shooting and are on their way back. Law enforcement right now considers them fugitives, and we really don't know whether they are on their way back. Currently, there's a manhunt underway. Obviously, we're going to keep an eye on that part of this story. Now to this. Sadly, school shootings are nothing new, nor the debates about what causes a kid to kill his classmates. But since Columbine, the question is always asked, and rightfully so, where were the parents? Tonight, as we told you, the parents are now the issue. These charges are intended to hold the individuals who contributed to this tragedy accountable and also send a message that gun owners have a responsibility. When they fail to uphold that responsibility, there are serious and criminal consequences. By all accounts, Ethan led a troubled life, and the morning of the shooting, his parents were at the school in a meeting about his behavior. He also allegedly drew a picture of a gun with blood and a note basically saying he can't stop the feelings. Both the day of the shooting and the day before, school officials spoke to Ethan about his behavior and then returned him to the classroom. Police say he walked out of a bathroom on Tuesday afternoon and started shooting. The prosecutor says his parents evidently were not surprised. When the news of the active shooter at Oxford High School had been made public, Jennifer Crumbly texted to her son at 11.22, I'm sorry, at 1.22 p.m., quote, Ethan, don't do it. There were reportedly a number of social media posts, you can see some of them here, by Ethan with the weapon of, that was allegedly used in the crime, including this one on Instagram. Police say Ethan's dad purchased the 9mm handgun used in the shooting the week before on Black Friday. So let's review where we are at. Parents knew a troubled young man was having serious issues. They had a handgun at home. The kid allegedly killed four at school. Now his parents are charged for behavior so negligent they should have known somebody, these four somebodies, four young teenagers with lives in front of them, would have gotten killed. We bring in Karen Conti, Chicago trial attorney, and joining us now. Uh, Karen, appreciate you being here. Uh, when we talked uh, on Wednesday night, you seemed pretty sure that these parents wouldn't be charged. Now they have been. Is this a, a political prosecution in your mind, or are there facts that have changed from what you heard today? Well, the law in Michigan does not favor charging parents in a situation like this. There's no lockup laws, so there's no law that says that parents have to lock up their guns. And there's no real uh, child access protection laws, which 28 states have. Uh, so generally speaking, you have to prove that a parent knew a child was going to commit a crime and did something to further that. That's very difficult to prove. But now, Leland, we have facts that we know that the parents knew about this child's uh, predisposition. In fact, one of the facts that, that I found very compelling was that the little boy was uh, actually Googling ammunition. The teacher called the mom and the mom texted the kid and said, you know what, just don't get caught next time. So she knew her son was Googling ammunition in school. So these facts have become more egregious. And I think that because of the nature of that, the court, the uh, prosecutor is using the involuntary manslaughter laws to, to hold them accountable. And I don't disagree with them. It's interesting, though, when you listen to what the prosecutor had to say, also send a message that gun owners have a responsibility. She said, I expect parents and everyone to have humanity and step in and stop a potential tragedy. Uh, none of those things are why you prosecute people. You prosecute them for actually breaking a law, which says, as I read the involuntary uh, manslaughter statute, you have, a reasonable person has to agree that their actions, not their inactions would cause death or bodily injury what actions positive actions did the parents take well in this case uh, they bought him a gun a few days ago knowing that he had trouble well did they buy and him a gun or did they buy, just buy a gun 
they, it's, I, my understanding is that they bought him a gun. It was his going to be his gun. How a 15-year-old gets possession of a gun is behind, beyond me. But here they are in school that day talking to the parents. And the parents knew that he had a gun and had access to it. They had it unlocked. And then he was Googling ammunition. And let me just go back to that prosecution issue that you just mentioned. Prosecutors can use a case to set a, pr a precedent. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, they have to have the facts. They have to be able to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. But they can pick and choose the cases they prosecute to send a message so this wouldn't happen again. And I think this will send a message to all parents out there, hey, maybe not for other kids getting hurt. What about your own kids that you're unlocking, you have unlocked guns in your house with a kid who has knowing uh, problems. So I do think this should send a message and it's a good idea for the prosecution to use that as an example. It's interesting how, how rare this is because it really would be a message. This is from the Washington Post. 105 school sh 145 school shootings since 1999, since Columbine. 80% of guns used were taken from family or friends. Adult gun owners were only charged in four cases. No charges stem from negligent storage laws. Those are laws you talked about that didn't uh, exist. Uh, but what's troubling is that it seems as though the system worked in this case, right? There were laws to charge the parents with, yet you've got the Michigan Attorney General, even before the victims are buried, turning this into a debate on, on gun ownership. Take a listen. Purchase a firearm at the age of 18, even though you can't buy a beer. Why can't we just make that 21? And I think it's time for us to move forward, to stop offering just our thoughts and prayers and take real action should these be two different conversations, whether or not the parents committed a crime? And if they committed a crime and we have laws on the books to prevent their actions, why do we need two, two new laws? Well, I think bad facts make either bad law or new good law, one or the other. And I think this case shines the light on the fact that Parents need to keep the guns safe, and especially when they know that someone has these issues. And I, I don't have a problem with, with the laws changing. I mean, I'm not talking about the laws of 18 versus 21, but just if you have guns in a home, for God's sakes, have, have them locked up for your, the benefit of your own children. And you should be held accountable if you don't do that. It's that simple. Well, right, but there are certain laws that say that if you know, you, we can have, it's a different a Second Amendment issue, right? Because if you are going to use a gun for self-defense, it's kind of hard to do that if it's locked up. The question is, do you have a strict liability law that if a non-locked gun is used by your children or taken by your children, that you have uh, some kind of responsibility? That's not here. So I, I, I keep coming back to the case against the parents because it feels so much like this is about sending a message and this is about politics. If by the Michigan statute you have to have done something that was so reckless as to positively know that you were going to kill somebody, involuntary manslaughter occurs when a person is accidentally killed due to someone else's criminal negligence or when someone is killed during another crime. Uh, someone else's criminal negligence. So, again, what did they do that was criminally positively negligent versus just sitting back and letting their son do something really terrible. Negligence doesn't necessarily mean you took some affirmative action. It could be that you took no action. And as a parent, you have an affirmative duty to keep your child safe. And if you know your child has mental health issues because you were at the school that morning, uh, talking to the teachers and knowing that they're doing all the things that he's doing, certainly they had a duty to act. And acting might have been to take the gun away, lock the gun up, get yeah. the kid mental health issue, issue help, uh, prevent him from going to school, talking to him, and not texting him saying, LOL, next time just don't get caught. Yeah, I think this re is a reasonable, clear case. Yeah, no, a reasonable case could, could say, like, you know, hey, uh, Ethan, maybe we need to look in your backpack because uh, we know there was a gun around the house. Where's right. the gun? Uh, or right. ask him when they were at school, on and on and on. We can all think about that. I, lawyers are great uh, at being able to argue both sides of the same topic. Uh, turn this around. What's their defense? Well, the defense is going to be that it's hard for me to argue this one. I have to really give this a good thought. And, you know, there may be other facts we don't know. Hey, you know what? The school didn't uh, find that he was a danger. The school said that he can come back to school. 
So they didn't think it. They were the professionals. Uh, we bought a gun. Everyone has a gun in Michigan. We go hunting. Right. Uh, we taught him safety. Uh, he, we talked to him about it. We thought he was going to be safe. We had no well, idea also, he was going to do it. Sure. It, it, and also, probably it, it, to, an, to another point, uh, if the school was so worried and he had drawn a picture of a gun, why not look through his backpack and his locker before you sent him back to uh, the classroom, which uh, brings up that issue. Hey, Karen, it's always a great conversation. Thank you. All right. Have a nice weekend, yeah, you, you, as, you as well. It's good to see you. Good to see you. All right. Obviously, there was a lot going on this week domestically. Omicron, the school shooting, et cetera. And while no one was looking, we may now be closer than ever to a military conflict with Russia, which, as we know, could... Get rather exciting rather quickly. Neither side, as of tonight, is blinking. This is the headline from The Intercept that caught our eye. Biden to Pentagon, keep the war machine running. The Biden administration envisions a virtually unchanged military footprint with a sharpened commitment to the bipartisan policy of Cold War-style hostility toward Russia and China. Well, certainly worked for Reagan with Russia. The Secretary of State went to Russia, and things escalated rather than de-escalated. We've made it clear to the Kremlin that we will respond resolutely, including with a range of high-impact economic measures that we've refrained from using in the past. That is some of the most serious language we've ever heard from Antony Blinken. But the Russian foreign minister responded by trying to shift the blame. Here's the subtitles. Продолжается деятельность НАТО по эскалации ситуации прямо на наших границах. НАТО отказывается от рассмотрения наших предложений. One thing you learn as a foreign correspondent is the Russians love to play the victim. So let's remember who the aggressor is here. Less than two months ago, this was the message from Vladimir Putin. He said, we're constantly voicing our concerns about this, talking about red lines, but we understand our partners, how shall I put it mildly, have a very superficial attitude to all our warnings and talk of red lines. Well... Vladimir Putin, trained by the KGB. This image pretty much says it all. Russia has a massive military buildup right on its border with Ukraine. They invaded back in 2014. I covered the story on the ground when the little green men, aka Russian special forces, took over eastern Ukraine. Some of the satellite imagery looked very similar back then. The provocations from Russia just don't stop there. They recently tested a hypersonic missile, a piece of technology that is fast enough to get past any U.S. missile defense system. Just yesterday, Reuters reported that Russia deployed a coastal missile system on an island near Japan, which could threaten U.S. aircraft carriers. It's another move by the Kremlin to beef up their military presence across the world. And then there was Jen Psaki describing Russia's recent actions today. I think it's important to remember where the provocative action is coming from at this point in time. It's not the United States. It's not Ukraine. In times like this, we rely on the insight of former Pentagon policy advisor, former Green Beret, Michael Waltz, decorated combat veteran. Good to see you, sir. As always, we appreciate it. Uh, you're Thanks, out there Leland. at the uh, defense, uh, Reagan Library Defense Summit and Forum. I'm wondering if uh, everyone's talking now about Russia rather than China. Well, I think it's a hef heavy dose of both, uh, Leland. You know, I think China absolutely is the most... Uh, complex and existential threat this country has ever faced that has the economic and military capability uh, to become a new world leader if the United States does not wake up uh, and, and begin treating them like the adversary that they are. But in the very near term, uh, Russia is still very dangerous. Uh, and I think at this point, it's not a matter of if, but when uh, Russia takes action in Ukraine and how far they go. So the question is, why is this all happening now? And I don't think it's a coincidence that it's happening in the wake of the debacle in Afghanistan. Uh, it's happening when Biden is back in office. As you mentioned, uh, the last time they invaded Crimea was, with, uh, was when President Obama was in office. And it's certainly not a coincidence that it's happening after uh, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline has come online and Russia can choke off gas to Western Europe, and fracture uh, any type of Western response. It's interesting that you talk about the response uh, scenario from the United States, because we saw what Barack Obama did in 2014. It really uh, didn't deter the Russians at all. Here's what President Biden says he's made clear to the Russians. Take a listen. What I am doing is putting together what I believe to be will be the most comprehensive and uh, 
meaningful set of initiatives to make it very, very difficult for Mr. Putin to, uh, to go ahead and do what people are worried he may do. You're out there at the Reagan Library. I just, I have to feel as though if we saw the same thing or when we did see the same kind of Russian actions back in the 1980s, the language was very different from Ronald Reagan. Yeah, I know, absolutely, Leo. And here's the problem with just talking about economic sanctions. In order for them to really work against the Russians, the Europeans have to be completely on board. Uh, and now that we've allowed the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, they are completely dependent, particularly the Germans, on Russians uh, and on Russian gas to heat their homes through the winter. Uh, so that, that is a massive, massive disconnect. Further, uh, you know, I think that we need much tougher and much clearer language from Biden, uh, like we got from, from Ronald Reagan, that we will not stand for this type of aggression. This could potentially be the largest land invasion since World War II. This will be a slippery slope. Uh, you know, today could be Ukraine, tomorrow will be uh, the Baltics, and then, uh, and then portions of NATO and Eastern Europe after that. The entire world is watching, the Iranians are watching, the North Koreans are watching, and certainly President Xi of China are watching. Uh, right. And this is a time uh, where d dictators are deterred by strength and they are emboldened by weakness. And I think every dictator in the world right now smells weakness in this White House, and that's why you're seeing these types of actions. Uh, I'll turn it around, though. Is it really worth the American lives that it would cost to push back a Russian invasion, or if we deployed missiles there with U.S. service personnel, if the Russians hit them? Is, that, is it really worth going to war with Russia over Ukraine? Well, Leland, there's a lot of middle ground uh, between doing nothing and tough diplo speak uh, and an all-out invasion of, of boots on the ground, you know, uh, U.S. forces against Russian forces. Uh, we need to be supplying uh, the Ukrainians lethal aid. As you mentioned, Obama literally threw blankets and MREs at the problem. They've been asking for years, for, particularly for air defense uh, weaponry, like stingers. Uh, we can begin those sanctions right now. We need to begin deterring Putin from taking this action, raising the costs and making it clear that there will be a number of costs rather than waiting until the, it takes the action and putting us, ourselves in that awful situation of allowing the slippery slope to happen or committing U.S. troops. That's why the time for clarity is right now, not after uh, he invades. Yeah, you make a good point that bullies are emboldened by weakness. The world tends to be a safer place when America uh, is strong. Uh, Congressman, it's good to see you as always. Thank you. Enjoy the weekend. All right. Thank you, Lou. Yeah, good to see you. Coming up, New York City's new safe space for drug users. It's not just heroin. It's now safe spaces for crack. Is this possibly a good idea? Plus, promoting inclusivity may have just crossed a line. Thousands of students in Chicago are now forced to walk into gender-neutral bathrooms. Starting today, students at Chicago Public Schools can use any bathroom they want. As the helpful signs show, it doesn't matter if you are a boy or a girl. You can use the bathroom you identify with at that time. To be clear, these are not new bathrooms created for transgender students. They are simply changing the signs, and now it's basically boy or girl. Do what you feel. If a 17-year-old boy decides he wants to use the girl's bathroom today, that's his right. Now, to be clear, we take no position on transgender bathrooms. I was bullied in high school, mercilessly, and I suffered from it. I have nothing but sympathy for kids who are struggling with who they are. But why should their identity and comfort come at the expense of perhaps hundreds of other students at the school who very reasonably may not want to share a bathroom with someone born the opposite sex? Friend calls it tyranny of the minority, in this case, the small minority, which is fine if that's the standard that we all live by. But it is exactly the opposite of what we've been told for the past 20 months. We as Americans have been constantly told to sacrifice our happiness for the good of the majority have a bad knee and are in crippling pain, you can't get elective surgery, so hospitals have room for COVID patients. 
We bankrupted entire industries because restaurants are non-essential. The livelihood of waiters didn't matter. Protect the public. Wear a mask. Wear a mask because it protects others, not you. Your kids must stay home from school because the teacher unions are worried about COVID spread. Get a vaccine to protect everybody else. Then it went to, we are mandating vaccines whether you like it or not. Why to protect everybody else? So on one hand, individual rights be damned in the name of the collective good. When it comes to transgender bathrooms, the right, safety, and comfort of the vast majority be damned in the name of a very few individuals. When things truly confuse us, we bring in Robert Patillo, civil rights attorney, radio host from Atlanta, taking a break from his wife's birthday weekend to join us and explain this. Robert, help us out here. Thank you so much, Leland. Uh, uh, look, I, I don't see why this is that big of a controversy. I, I think often becomes part of the, the political chum as it is to feed that feeding frenzy. Uh, about 1.8% of teens in this country identify as being transgender, which is actually over double what it was in 2007. So it's a growing population that gain more acceptance. Uh, and, but the chance of this actually becoming an issue at any particular school with 1.8% of the population is negligible at best. So I think that people overreact uh, to, to mm -hmm. these issues against it's an overblown uh, issue. The, the chance of your child being interacting with a transgender person in their bathroom uh, is about the same as, you know, uh, uh, something else is under 2% in our population. So I think people should take a step back, understand your bathroom at home is gender inclusive. The bathroom, every bathroom you go to and most of your life, there's not a boy and girl bathroom. Everyone just goes. So I don't see why we should make this such a big fight in my public policy. Yeah, I, th it's a good point. I'm, what I what I have a trouble with is when you look at the signs that says all gender identities and expressions are welcome here. So you can ma you make that choice however you want. There's schools in Chicago that have three, four thousand kids, so there are a number of children who are going to interact in this. Say, in some ways, when you make it as simple as just choose how you feel today, with this, which is what the signs do, is it insulting to kids who really have had this? issue and have gone through a transition and, and live this new life, why not make it so that those kids are protected from anybody just going, hey, this is how I feel? Well, you know, you, the, the one of the things I've worked with the Trevor Project on many of these issues of LGBTQ youth uh, and the transition process is a it, it's not as if you just wake up one day and you decide I identify as, uh, as a different gender identity It's a transitioning process. So you can't tell somebody at one point of the transition they're any less uh, that at another point in the transition because you're not getting into their headspace. So giving them this space, I think it be, creates a more inclusive environment. Let's look at some of the stats they have on transgender youth. Uh, Seventy seven percent of transgender youth report uh, Experiencing major depression in the past year. 52% have considered suicide. So, 35% uh, have attempted suicide in the last year. I, I, I understand the rights of people who are going through that process. And they obviously need to be helped and, and made to feel loved and included and everything else. But should there be any weight given to the rights of all the other kids who may say, I don't want... Sally, who used to be Sam, coming in to the girls' bathroom? Just go to the bathroom after Sam goes out. I, I mean, just wait like five minutes. I'm pretty sure they're not camping out in there uh, for hours. And I, 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 I'm yet to see what the great public harm is to this. Because think about it the other way. If you're a fully transgen, uh, transgen, uh, trans, transitioned youth, uh, you've had your birth certificate changed, you've been on hormone therapy, you're going to force that, uh, that person who's now Sam to go to the girl's bathroom despite presenting as a male. That doesn't make sense. Who's going to enforce this, uh, quite yeah, frankly? Well, they're going to have hall yeah, monitors outside the bathroom to make to check the genders and the birth certificates of everybody going again. So I think this inclusive policy is where the world is going. And look, and well, the you're, you're, you're had gender you're, inclusive bathrooms. Yeah, you're certainly right. It is where the world uh, is going, whether people uh, agree or not. Hey, Robert, it's good to see you as always. Enjoy the weekend, all right? Thanks for taking the time. Thanks, you too. Yeah, thanks. Times Magazine, just one week away from announcing the 2021 Person of the Year. There's still hope for yours truly. The people we think should win and the people more perhaps more importantly we think shouldn't even be nominated that's next at this point in the year we're looking at the sharpest one-year decline in unemployment ever president biden says everything's fine but americans do not feel the same way we'll examine exactly where the disconnect is our economy is markedly stronger than it was a year ago and today, 
the incredible news that our unemployment rate has fallen to 4.2 percent. If you listen to President Biden talking about the jobs report today, you'd think everything is fine with our economy. But while Mr. Biden thinks that, the American public does not. And there's some numbers to prove it. This is the president's average approval rating from Real Clear Politics. The red line tells the story. A growing number of Americans are not happy with the job he's doing, more than half the country to be exact. Even more people disapprove of his handling of the economy. You can see there's about a 10-point spread, approve, disapprove. But the White House is defiant and won't admit what we all know. This month's jobs report was terrible. Here's Press Secretary Jen Psaki reacting to it this morning on MSNBC. Jobs number just crossed. 210 jobs just added. So 210,000. Um, so if we look at that breaking news right now, that's a number that feels a little what? A little off? Uh, what people can expect the president to continue to say today, month to month, mm -hmm. is that what we're seeing are good trends. Hmm. A big part of the reason people are upset with the economic recovery is prices on everything is up, especially gas prices. They're at a seven-year high. President Biden, however, said today, don't worry about it. We've seen oil and gas prices out of the wells. Oil and gas prices on the wholesale market come down significantly. Significantly. The Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee took note. Here's the tweet. It, it does look like it is a significant trend down in this DCCC tweet, thanking President Biden for bringing prices down. Then you look at how much they've gone down, a whopping two cents. With that, we bring in our all-star panel, Niall Stanage, White House columnist for our sister publication, The Hill, Dr. Lauren Wright, associate research scholar and lecturer in politics at Princeton University. Good to see uh, both of you. Niall, why not just admit the obvious? I think because most politicians, including the president, try to make the best case that they can make. To be fair to President Biden, he has talked about inflation and he has talked about people not necessarily feeling all the benefits of uh, economy, the economy in terms of unemployment rate declining and so forth. But he has been trying to make the best argument that he can. And I do think presidents have to thread a narrow line on this. I mean, you say, why not admit that things are bad? But Jimmy Carter did that 40 years ago when people are still talking about what a mistake it was. <laughs> well said, well said. All right, so Lauren, we put up the numbers, uh, Biden approval numbers on the economy. This is the RCP average, approve 37.6, disapprove 55.6. What is the economy a proxy for? The whole presidency, it's the, the most important issue on everyone's minds. And I think where, I mean, Niall is exactly right. Every single president, regardless of party, tries to deflect blame. They claim credit sometimes for things they have no control over, and they spin things positively um, where they can. But the, the more surprising part of this press conference to me uh, was where Biden was saying, look, you see pictures of empty shelves. That's not true on average across the country. And so don't worry about that all so much. You know, he talks about these longstanding trends and is asking people to give him mm. faith and to say, if you pass my next trillion dollar package, then things will start to look up. It just takes a long time. Uh, it's, it's a really tough messaging position to be in as a president when you're asking people to give you the benefit of the doubt and you're telling them, you know, you're driving past the gas station and you're buying groceries and we're telling you that's not what most Americans are experiencing. Yeah. That's really politically risky. Yeah, we actually have that soundbite you were talking about. Take a listen. I saw a couple of your stations put on. You found some empty shelves. <laughs> They're old empty shelves, but it doesn't matter. But go back and take a look at some of those shelves again, okay? But the, the, the point is that the vast majority of the shelves are filled. All right, so I guess, do we believe the president or our lying eyes at times, Niall? The White House have a plan other than what Lauren described, which is just keep doubling down, pass the next bill, pass the next bill, and sometime, I promise, it's going to get better? Certainly their argument is it's going to get better over time. But I think Lauren makes a really great point when she talked about the fact that the vast majority of shelves 
nobody really cares on an individual basis what's happening with the vast majority of shelves. They care about can they get the things that they need or want to get at a price that they expect to be able to buy them for. That's why inflation in particular, I think, is such a dangerous issue for the president. People who don't follow politics on a 24-7 basis, feel the effects of that. And it's really difficult if the White House is trying to make a sort of abstract or generalized argument. It's really very difficult to get traction with that if people are experiencing the downside in their daily lives. Yeah, certainly, it, Lauren pointed this out really well, that it, so much of how you feel goes into presidential approval. And if you, you keep feeling like you're spending more money, then you don't feel very good. Lauren, we put up uh, the Real Clear Politics average just overall for the presidency. How sticky is this? Once you get to the low 40s or at times the high 30s that President Biden has flirted with, uh, is there a way to really turn this around or does it kind of become baked in after a while if people are disgruntled long enough? It's very hard to turn it around if the major news story does not change and if these underlying conditions do not change. We are still a far way away from the midterms and especially the next presidential election. And so I do think it's too early to say Biden is doomed and the administration is doomed. Um, we know from our news cycle that Americans can switch their attention span, especially when economic conditions start to improve. So it's not uh, it's not a death sentence, but at the same time, it's not a good position to be in. And anyone who's looking at these numbers and saying uh, everything's great uh, is probably not telling the whole story. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Niall, Lauren, great to see both of you as always. Thanks a lot. Have a great weekend. Thanks, you too. Thanks, right. Leland. New York City's drug addict safe space may be causing more harm than good. We'll tell you the community activists who want the community drug space gone. And we want to thank you for helping to make News Nation the fastest growing cable news network. We appreciate you watching. We'll see you on Twitter at Leland Bitter. Welcome back. We have all heard about safe spaces. Well, now in New York, there are safe spaces for smoking crack. Yes, actually safe spaces for smoking crack. Earlier this week, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio said the city had two sites, which he calls overdose prevention centers. Both were in Manhattan, one in East Harlem, the other in Washington Heights. People, of course, can have a legitimate debate about safe injection sites, namely to prevent opiate overdoses and a safe needle exchange. They also bring in some of the most dangerous parts of society, the drug dealers, to be close to their customers in a neighborhood, often close to schools. But it's difficult to understand a city-sponsored safe house that allows the smoking of crack cocaine. Josh Clennon manages low-income housing cooperatives in Harlem, also a community activist there with the Greater Harlem Coalition, and joins us now. All right. Uh, Obviously, there's some drug users who are not going to die of overdoses because of these safe injection sites. Is it worth bringing crack addicts into these troubled neighborhoods to, to have that happen? That's uh, a great question, Leland. So Harlem, you know, of course, is a community that was hit hard by the war on drugs. So we're a community that's very sensitive to this issue. Uh, we fully support harm reduction policy and programs to, you know, decriminalize and uh, reduce uh, the harm uh, experienced by people who suffer from substance abuse disorder. But the problem that we face here in Harlem is that we have an overabundance of treatment facilities. So Harlem hosts 17% of the city's substance abuse uh, treatment facilities while only being 3.5% of the city's population. In addition to that, if you look at the state's uh, Oasis's own data, it shows that 70% of the patients coming into Harlem to utilize these facilities do not live in our community. They're traveling as far as Staten Island. So this is just a problem in terms of the city and state have really created a public safety hazard in our community. We have an overabundance of people traveling to our community mm. to utilize these programs, drug dealing, things of that nature, right in front of our schools. And we're really looking for the city to create an even distribution of these sites. Why, don't, why don't you think they're doing that? Why don't, why don't we see one of these centers on uh, the Upper East Side, say? 
Well, that's the question that, you know, we we constantly have been asking Oasis uh, for the past five or more years now. Why don't we why don't we see these sites opening up on the Upper West Side, Upper East Side? And, you know, it's obvious, you know, this is a, a situation where race and class play a, a big factor. You know, Harlem is a lower income community and, you know, uh, you know, our elected uh, leaders and state see, agencies saying that they can just push us around, essentially. Yeah. And, and dump these injection centers and everything that it brings uh, in Harlem. I I'm interested in this because so much of the African-American community and the lower lower class community has really been hit hard by the vaccine mandates and the restaurants that have been closed and the service industry and on and on. Uh, when people show up at these injection sites, are they demanding people show vaccine cards? Like if you go into a restaurant, are they trying to reduce the amount of COVID that's being brought into your community too? That's a great question uh, that I don't have the answer to, but I hope they are. Um, you know, I think that, you know, again, I want to say that, you know, these programs, it's great that they're going to reduce overdose deaths. We want to reduce deaths from substance abuse disorder. That's important, but we need to make sure that these sites are evenly distributed throughout our entire city so that people have access to treatment in their own communities. Imagine traveling uh, one hour every day back and forth to get life-saving treatment. It doesn't make any sense. Well, I guess it, it doesn't make any sense if the goal is treatment. It does make sense if you want to be able to have a treatment center that's not in your backyard and dump it in, in Harlem. What are some of the problems that you guys have seen with this overabundance, if you will, of treatment centers uh, in Harlem? Absolutely. We've definitely seen um, reduced traffic to our small businesses. We've definitely seen, you know, increase in, in petty crimes, theft, uh, just loitering, uh, public, um, you know, public urination, things of that nature. Um, it's just, you know, for, for people who live, especially in this immediate area, which I'm one of those individuals who do, I live just two blocks away from the majority of these facilities, you know, on a daily basis, you're you're trying to um, get yeah, yeah, you're surrounded by you're surrounded yeah. by drug users when you're trying to have a business or start housing exactly. offices or do all sorts of different things. Um, yeah, Josh, I got to tell you, keep fighting the good fight. The people of Harlem are lucky to have you. Thank you so much. Appreciate the time. Thanks. We'll talk soon. And up next, who we would love and also hate to see as Time Magazine's 2021 Person of the Year. Welcome back. You too can participate in Time Magazine's search for the 2021 Person of the Year. The pool of nominees this year is quite interesting. From the Times website, we've got Dr. Fauci, Putin, President Xi, Joe Biden. Don't forget, Times also considering Britney Spears, Meghan and Harry they're considering for unknown reasons. Uh, I do not make the list, in case you are wondering, and neither did Tony Katz. That's why we're both available on Friday night to chat about things. Uh, all right. <laughs> I, I am shocked to learn this for the first time. <laughs> it was news to both of us. All right. Uh, you know, what's interesting is, is that very few of the people on that list did you sort of say could be truly universally admired for greatness? Well, I mean, isn't that what we all think of uh, of the list? If, if we're going to still believe that Time Magazine has any uh, kind of credit whatsoever, it's to the idea that we we would think that the person that or they they select brings us a value. Very often, it's somebody who is just radically polarizing. Yeah. So the criteria they have is the person or persons who most affected the news in our lives for good or ill and embodied what was most important about. Uh, the year, which arguably you could say would be Anthony Fauci. Yeah, you you, you could uh, for good and for bad and really for bad and quite literally for awful. You, if also if there's a, a category involving how many times you can run to a television camera, well, then Fauci is a hands down well, winner. The, the Cuomo uh, brothers would qualify for that, too, wouldn't they? Talk, talk about the top of my list of people who should not uh, get this award. Andrew or, or Chris, they can, they can arm wrestle it out to see who's worse. I'm going for push. No, wait, it's Andrew. He let people die. Well, yeah, uh, among lots of other things. I had, a, I had no's on my list of LeBron James, uh, who bowed down to China, and Meghan and Harry, although it would be kind of funny if they put them on the cover because it would just give us, you and I, endless segments. Uh, about them. It was interesting to me, the one person who, they, they had Britney Spears, they had all sorts of sort of crazy people on the list. 
Uh, you and I both came up with Enos Cantor, uh, the Boston Celtics player who is the one athlete consistently standing up uh, to China. And what I thought was stunning was of all the sort of random people and athletes, and there were some baseball players on the list, Cantor, who really actually is changing the world a little bit and trying to, wasn't there. I wonder why. Yeah, first of all, it's Enos Cantor Freedom. Let's get his name uh, me. correct. He changed his name. And there are two sets of athletes that have actually taken on China. One is Enos Cantor, Enos Cantor Freedom, and the other is the Women's Tennis Association, which pulled out of China because they don't know where Peng Shui is. And they are leading the way the NBA could learn. Speaking of people who need to get educated, LeBron James and the NBA could learn a lot from the Women's Tennis Association. Yeah, I think we both agree on that. Cup brings up an interesting point, uh, and you said at the beginning, which you normally do, uh, and that's why we have you here. Does it really matter anymore? You look at who the cover people were, Times Men of the Year, you saw Stalin on there in some of these names. Does it have an impact anymore? Well, I, we, we love awards, right? We love award shows, even though the ratings are down because they won't stop lecturing to us. And very much, you get into the idea that they select people who are there to lecture. But if we're going to talk about people who have raised the level of discourse and have really engaged the conversation for a lot of people, how about Christopher Rufo for his work regarding critical race theory? I didn't ask if you liked him, but let's face the facts. He has created and built a conversation that is lasting and sustaining for parents all across uh, America. Now, maybe they mean this on the world yeah. stage, yeah. but he's a guy on my list. Well, it's just certainly people who affect, who, the person who most affected news in our lives. The one thing that I really hope time doesn't do, and maybe you'll agree with me, we got like 45 seconds left, is they don't pick like a group of people again, like frontline workers or this sort of amorphous group and are like, oh, these are the people who most affected our life. Pick somebody so then we can all talk about it and be irritated. Look, I don't mind if they pick nurses. Oh, well, yeah, no, I, nurses, totally, nurses agree. But frontline workers, I'm, I can I'm do totally that. I'm totally fine with it. But whoever they pick isn't going to work for half the country. And that's really, I, I, I guess, the point, uh, that nothing's going to work for everybody. There's no one person to be like, yeah, we see how they provided a value, or yeah, we see how they changed the conversation, because the internal politics, you're right, do get involved in it. But I, I, I'd still vote for Enos Cantor Freedom and, and women's tennis now that I've had some time to think about it. There, there you go. We, we end the week on agreement between two good friends. Nice to see you, my friend. Bourbon together sometime soon. Tony Katz, ladies and gentlemen. On the shelf, baby. We'll, we'll leave you with a sift through some of the old Time Magazine covers. Gives you a little bit of perspective. Dan Abrams next. I'll see you Monday. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.